Thank you for listening to Calvary Aurora's weekly Bible study. We pray as you study through God's Word that you're blessed by God's abounding grace. Second Samuel chapter 9. And we will pray. Father, we do indeed love you because you first loved us. You've gone to such great lengths, Lord, to reach us. You've sent us your word. You've sent us your son. You've sent us your spirit. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to worship your Son, as we continue to worship Jesus through the study of your Word, that your Spirit would speak. That, God, that you would give life-giving, living hope to all who are here tonight. Or some for the first time, draw them, carry them, Lord, to your table. Lord, Some need their hope renewed. Draw them. Give them the grace to lay their burdens down. Carry them again to your table, Lord. Remind them of who they are in you. A son or a daughter of the King of Kings, seated at his table continually with full rights and privileges forevermore. Please, Lord, minister by your Spirit through your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever met a man named Mephibosheth? (laughs) It's not that common of a name for a man. But there are some common lessons in this man named Mephibosheth here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Some lessons to be learned through his life that are common to us all. See, this man named Mephibosheth was crippled because of a fall. He lived a life of isolation because he misunderstood the character of the king. But then the king called him into his courtroom, not to kill him, but rather to show him kindness. Kindness because of a covenant. And not only did the king show him kindness, but he also invited him to be seated at the king's table continually as one of the king's own sons with full rights and full privileges forever, continually. And so carried to the table, Mephibosheth was not killed by the king. He was shown kindness because of a covenant. There's there's some lessons to be learned in this man named Mephibosheth. And so God recorded some scenes from his life for us. And the central scene is found here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, as we go through this chapter, we're going to read it all together, and we're going to go back and we're going to consider the context, what happened before, what happened after, how does it all connect. And then at the end, we're going to look at some of those lessons to be learned in this chapter, in the life of this man. And we'll look at those lessons one at a time. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, let's start with verse 1, and then let's read all the way to the end to verse 13. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now, David said... Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, saw, or the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face, prostrated himself, and then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, 
for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belong to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so your servant will do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. And he was lame in both his feet. So, on the surface, it's, it's an interesting account. One would even say it's a beautiful story uh, of, a, of a king showing kindness to a man who had been crippled. But when we consider the context of this particular passage, there's even more in the life of this man named Mephibosheth. There's so much more. So, before we go back through the chapter and look at those lessons one at a time, let's consider the context by asking some questions. And what were some of the questions that came to mind as you were reading through that chapter? You're just thinking of some of the questions that you want to ask God about the particulars in that passage. Was one of the questions, how did Mephibosheth become lame in both of his feet? What happened to him? Well, the Bible answers that question. It was one of the questions that I had when I first read that passage. And the answer is found in 2 Samuel chapter 4. So turn there now, 2 Samuel chapter 4, a few pages to the left. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we're not only going to learn how Mephibosheth was crippled, but also why it's so remarkable that David, the current king, wanted to show him kindness. So 2 Samuel chapter 4, look at verse 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old. When the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and he became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So here we're considering the context. There was a king named Saul. And there was another king called David. And those two kings coexisted for a long period of time. Now, the majority of that time, jealous King Saul was chasing the rightful king named David, trying to kill him. I mean, chasing him for years, trying to kill King David. But he was unsuccessful. And eventually, Saul himself and his son Jonathan were killed in battle. So King Saul and his immediate successor Jonathan were dead. And now David would be the undisputed king. But then there's a twist. See, Saul had a successor. His name was Jonathan. Saul and Jonathan died. But Jonathan had a successor. Jonathan had a son, and his name was Mephibosheth. So when his dad died, his family fled because they were fearing retaliation from King David for the way that Saul had treated King David. And so when he was five years old, Mephibosheth and his family fled. And Saul's grandson fell, and he became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, paint that picture for a second. I mean, terrified, grief-stricken. Your dad's dead. Your grandfather is dead. Your, your nurse picks you up. Why did he have a nurse? Some say that his name means tainted breath. It, it very well could have been that he had lung issues or asthma. His nurse picks him up and runs fleeing for their life, terrified at what David might do now that his dynasty is in power. But while she's running, she trips and he falls. And he falls so hard that he's never able to walk again. 
He became lame in both of his feet. And we wonder how exactly. You know, did he crush his spine? Did he break both of his ankles beyond the ability to heal, beyond the ability to walk? We don't know. But what we do know is that all of this together would be extremely emotionally, spiritually, physically crushing and traumatic, adding injury to insult in this particular situation. And all of this happened to him when he was five years old. My dad died. I think the king wants to kill me, and I'm crippled. But now here's another question. Did the king want to kill him? No. King David did not want to kill Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was in isolation in a lonely place because he misunderstood the true character of the king. He misunderstood the true character of the current king named David. See, most kings would kill all of the descendants of the former dynasty to make sure that there was no rival left. But this king named David wanted to show kindness to the descendants of the former dynasty. And not just kindness for kindness' sake, but rather kindness because of a covenant. So as we consider the context, now let's consider this covenant. Let's turn now to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. There was a covenant between two very unlikely friends, David and Saul's son, Jonathan. David and Jonathan were the best of friends, good friends. The scriptures say their souls were knit together. Now, Jonathan was watching what was happening to his father. The Lord was lifting his hand off of King Saul, and Saul would eventually go crazy as he was chasing in a jealous rage King David. And Jonathan was watching what was happening to his friend David. God's hand was more and more on his friend David. And so as he was watching all of this happen, he asked David to enter into with him a covenant to show kindness to his physical descendants after David's dynasty rose to power. Because it was common for kings to slaughter all of the descendants of the former dynasty. So here's the covenant. Let's start at verse 1. Now 1 Samuel chapter 20. Then David fled from Nauth and Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So Jonathan said to him, By no means, you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, there is but a step in between me and death. See, at this moment, in these verses, Jonathan was having a hard time understanding or rather believing that his dad wanted to kill his friend David. But as this truth started to sink in, Jonathan saw what would happen when this plan of his father would inevitably backfire. Jonathan saw God's hand on his friend David. Jonathan knew what was going to happen. So anticipating this, he asked David to enter into a covenant with his descendants. Look at verse 12 now. Verse 12 says, Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan, but if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you you away, that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. A covenant. A covenant to show kindness to the descendants of the former dynasty. Now turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. So we've considered the context. What happened before? What set the stage? And we've considered the context by asking some questions. 
Now we want to look at the lessons that we can learn from the passage that we've been looking at. And in order to learn those lessons, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask the Lord some questions. Lord, what lessons do you want us to learn in your word today? What questions do you want us to ask? What answers do you want us to have and hold on to? What do you want us to know about your character as our king? Now, as we go through this, remember there's not only lessons to be learned, but there's a metaphor in this man named Mephibosheth. We listen to those descriptors of his life. You know, he was crippled because of a fall. Do you see the picture? He was living in a lonely place because he misunderstood the character of the king. But then eventually the king called him to his courtroom. And Mephibosheth was scared for his life, thinking the king wanted to kill him. Falling on his face, he was told, I don't want to kill you. I want to show you kindness because of a, of a covenant. I want to show you mercy. I want to be good to you. I want to go as far as inviting you to sit at my table as one of my sons forever. Do you see the picture? So now let's go through it a little bit at a time and, and ask the Lord to continually personalize it for us as we consider the character of our king and the kindness he wants to show to us because of his covenant. So verse 1 once again of 2 Samuel 9. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now we've seen there's a reason why David asked this question the way that he did. It's been a long time, actually, since David came to the throne. It's been a long time since the dynasty of Saul ended and the dynasty of David began. And there was, there was a legitimate question as to whether or not there was anyone left from the house of Saul. So he says, verse 1 again, Now David said, Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2, And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, who is lame in his feet. Now pause and consider, okay? Pause and consider. Ziba answered honestly, right? But honestly, I wonder why. Because knowing what we know about how kings would handle the physical descendants of former dynasties, he was basically offering Mephibosheth up on a platter, but what did he say about Mephibosheth? He said, well, he's lame in both of his feet. Now, he could have possibly said this. He could have included this piece of information to try to convince the king that he's not a viable rival. You don't need to worry about Mephibosheth. I'm answering you honestly because I'm fearing for my own life. There is a descendant of, of Saul. He's Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, named Mephibosheth, but he's lame in both of his feet. Now, David was not like most kings. He did not want to kill him. He wanted, he said twice now, to show him kindness. Kindness because of a covenant with his friend Jonathan. He wanted to show him the kindness of God. That's what he said the second time. And kindness means to show thyself to be merciful and good. To show thyself to be merciful and good. Remember that definition as we're considering the character of our king. And the kindness he wants to show to us. Now look at verse 3. The king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Now, once again, pause and consider. What does low debar mean? It means no pasture. We have a phrase in our vernacular, the grass is always greener on the other side. Well, where Mephibosheth was, there wasn't any grass. No chance for it to be green. 
It was a lonely, isolated place. Low debar, no pasture, broken by a fall, crippled by a fall. Mephibosheth has lived a lonely life in isolation and in fear. In fear since he was five that any day now David's going to find him and kill him. And in verse 5, it seems as though his worst fears are coming true. The king found him. The king called him. Called him to come to his courtroom. But at this point, Mephibosheth had no idea that the king wanted to show him kindness. And every fiber of his being probably thought he was going to be killed. So as best you can, place yourself in the sandals, the sadly unused sandals of this man named Mephibosheth as he's carried into the courtroom of this king named David. Let's start once again at verse 4. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face, prostrated himself, and then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Now again, pause and consider. There had to, at this point, be an explosion in the heart and mind of this man named David because a very similar situation just happened between David and his king in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's look at it. Let's see it together. A few pages to the left. See, David in 2 Samuel 7 was overwhelmed by the king of kings, the king of kings, his mercy and his goodness And David was not a perfect man, and so he needed mercy. He needed the goodness and grace of God. He's not a perfect man by any means. David was a sinner. David was a a failure in many, many ways. But David sought God. He sought the heart of God, the mind of God, the righteousness of God, and God blessed David. The king of kings was merciful and good to this man named David. He was so good to this man named David that there was a point where David was so grateful for the grace of God that he wanted to do something good for God. And so one day he's talking to his friend named Nathan and he says, I want to build a house for God. So he says, see here, I live in a house of cedar, a palace of cedar, and the ark of the covenant is out there in a tent. I want to do something good for God. I want to build God a house. We don't have time to go into all the details, but there was a point where God's response through his friend Nathan was basically this. David, that's cute. It's great that you want to do something great for me. It's great that you want to build me a house, but you got bloody hands, David. You're not going to do it. Your son's going to do it. And and you know what? I'm going to build you a house. You want to do something good? I'm, I'm going to build you a house, a heritage, a lineage. In fact, here's my promise to you. One of your sons is going to sit on your throne forever. And once again, we see the grace of God. I mean, just the amazing grace of God. An explosion in David's heart where the only thing he can think to do is to just go and sit before God. Let's pick it up in verse 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the last verse of God's promise to David. God speaking here to David says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then, verse 18, King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Have you ever felt like that? God's just so good to you. It's so unmerited. Might even be in the midst of a season of your own sin. And he's just good and kind and 
merciful to you. And you just, who am I? Look up at the start. Who am I? During worship, I was just having flashbacks to scenes from my own life, my own walk with the Lord and how the Lord has carried me this far. Who am I, Lord, that you would even think about me, let alone communicate to me, let alone die for me? Who am I? And it sounds similar to what Mephibosheth said in 2 Samuel chapter 9, doesn't it? Mephibosheth said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Now, once again, when we consider the context, it adds a little bit more oomph to what David said to Mephibosheth, what David wanted to do for Mephibosheth. David was so overwhelmed with how good God had been to him, how kind God had been to him, he couldn't wait to show that kind of kindness to another undeserving person. Kindness because of a covenant. Is there anybody left? I, I just really want to show them the kindness of God. Well, let's go back now. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll finish up, and then I have some questions for you. 2 Samuel chapter 9, let's start this time with verse 7. Verse 7. Verse 7 says, So David said to him, Do not fear. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belong to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so your servant will do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was lame in both His feet. God doesn't want us to forget that last part. He was lame in both his feet. When the king called for him, what had to happen? He had to be carried into the courtroom of the king. When he was called to the king's table, what had to happen? He had to be carried to the king's table. So looking through this, I mean, the the picture painted is, is so universal to all of us that stand before the king of kings, considering his character. When his when his kindness is shown to us and we realize that maybe we misinterpreted his character all along. We didn't have to be in fear or in isolation. We can come into his courtroom. The Bible even goes as far to say you should boldly come into his courtroom because of his great and precious promises. Wow, what an invitation. So although you may have never met a man named Mephibosheth in your lifetime, it's not the most common name, There are lessons to be learned through the life of this man that are common to us all. Mephibosheth was crippled because of a fall. And you and I were as well. We all fell in Adam. We all lost our own ability to walk with God on our own. We were all, we are all, (laughs) descendants of a former dynasty. There was a first Adam There is a second Adam who is going to rule and reign forevermore. Many of us lived lives of isolation, running from the king of kings because we didn't understand his true character. And when he called us for the first time, when we felt him calling us, we were scared. I don't want to go into his courtroom. I'm going to spontaneously combust in his courtroom. You may have been invited here tonight and you just think, oh my goodness, stepping foot into a church, I just don't know what's going to happen. Everyone's going to know that I'm a a sinner, that I'm broken, that I'm, I'm crippled on the inside. And then you come here tonight and you realize that God does not want to kill you. 
He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he wants all men to be saved. He wants to show you kindness because of a covenant, a covenant with his one and only son, a new covenant in the blood of Christ, which we celebrated tonight, coming to the Lord's table. He wants to show you kindness, mercy. He wants to give you his goodness. He wants to invite you to eat at his table as one of his sons and one of his daughters with full rights and full privileges forevermore. Have you forgotten that? Maybe you've known the Lord for a long time, but you find yourself in this very common mistake of going to God and then becoming instantly aware of your own sin and then saying to your heavenly Father, oh man, I'm sorry, God, I'll really work on all of that and when I get all that taken care of, then I'll come back and we can have fellowship. And what you don't realize is that you're broken, you're crippled, you can't do it on your own. You have to be carried. You have to be carried and he will carry you. He will do all the work for you as you trust him by faith. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never answered the invitation for salvation. Maybe it's the first time you've understood that the king of kings wants to show you kindness and not take you out, not kill you. And you need to respond to his invitation. So here's my questions for you. What's keeping you from answering the king's call? What's stopping you? What's hindering you? What's keeping you living a life of isolation? What's stopping you from answering the king's call and being carried into his courtroom? Maybe it is a fall. Maybe somebody dropped you hard. And it hurt so bad that you want nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with this king of kings. Maybe it was a ministry leader. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was a family member. Somebody dropped you hard. And you feel like, even if I mustered every single last ounce of strength, I could not approach God. It's okay. He can carry you. He's called you. He can carry you. Maybe, maybe you've been crippled by the fall a descendant of the former dynasty. The same applies to you. No matter what has crippled you in your life and in your life of sin, the Lord can carry you, the Lord can heal you, the Lord can seat you at his table because of his covenant. He can show you kindness. So, as we go into prayer and as we sing this last song, I asked JJ if there's people that are going to come up wanting to minister to you and to pray for you, I want you to consider the call that the king has extended to you to come to him. And maybe sitting here tonight, you, you don't feel like you have any of the strength to come to him. You just, there's no way that you could lift yourself and walk. But it's just a matter of faith, just the faith of a mustard seed, just a little, little bit of turning your will towards God and saying, yes, God, I need you to heal me, to carry me. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to be seated at your table and you'll find yourself soon enough on your feet. You'll find yourself walking forward for prayer. Maybe, maybe you're here tonight and like we said, somebody dropped you so hard you're having the hardest time getting over that fall. You just feel crippled because of that fall. You feel like you can't move forward. There's people here that want to pray for you tonight too. Help you get through that, to love you the same before, during, and after any conversation with any content in that conversation. The Lord wants you to be healed and whole, full freedom, unhindered fellowship with him at his table. So we're going to pray, we're going to sing as you feel the Lord lift you and carry you. Come forward and we'll pray for you, we'll minister to you. God in heaven, here we are tonight. We've heard from your word. We've poured our hearts out to you in song. We ask for you to speak through your word by your spirit, and we trust that you have. I love what my brother read from your word tonight, that it's not by might nor by power. It's not by the power of persuasion or a man's ability. It's, it's you working through your word in simplicity. And God, we trust that you have. Apart from the lack or liabilities or all the effort we could muster, you work through your word by your spirit. We trust you, God. So God, carry people, lift them.
carry them into your courtroom, show them kindness, establish them at your table as one of your adopted sons and daughters, unhindered fellowship. God, do it. We love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray that you've been touched by this study from Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call area code 303-628-7200. Be blessed this week in the Lord.